The last two weeks, we're wrestling with the question of trusting God. Last week, we looked at the topic, can I trust God? And this week, we're looking at the topic, will I trust God? Last week, we looked at Psalms 121, and in that passage, it taught us several truths about God's trustworthiness. Just in case you weren't here last week, or like me, you've slept since last week. Um, Let me quickly recap the things that we talked about. We began with the premise that if there's a single event that happens in our lives, a single event that happens in my life or your life that God doesn't know about, a single event that happens in your life that catches God by surprise, then we can't trust God with our lives. If there's one thing that happens that God says, wait a minute, how did that happen? Then there's no way we can trust Him with our lives. If God takes a break and takes a nap for 30 minutes, we can't trust Him with our lives. But Psalms 121, the psalmist gives us three points to remind us that God is trustworthy. And he makes three specific points. Number one, God is the creator. Therefore, nothing is too big for him. The God that created you, the God that created everything out of nothing is the one that watches over you. Therefore, nothing is too big for him. No matter how big your trial is, no matter how big your obstacle is, no matter what you're facing in life, if God can create stuff out of nothing, he can handle the difficulties of your life. The second thing that we looked at in Psalm 121 is that God never sleeps. He never has to take a break. Therefore, we can, therefore, nothing catches him by, off guard. Nothing surprises him. Nothing shocks him. He never sleeps. He's always awake. He's always watching over us. His eyes are always on us. And we talked about that the very reason that me and you can sleep is because God doesn't sleep. The reason that we can put our heads down at night and rest is because we know that when we're sleeping, God's eyes are on us. We can rest. We can take breaks. We can relax because God never does. And the third thing we looked at was that God is always by our side. He's always with us. Therefore, nothing, catch, nothing will happen to us unless God allows it. He's always with us. He's our creator. He never sleeps, and he's always with us. And because he's always with us, it promises his protection over our lives, and it also promises his presence in our lives. He protects us, and he's always with us. That means no matter what you go through, God has a plan and purpose for it. And the entire psalm pointed to God's total and complete sovereignty over our lives. And we came to the conclusion last week that if nothing catches God off guard, if there isn't a single event in history outside of God's sovereign plan, then we can trust Him with our lives. If there is not an event in our lives that surprises God, if He knows everything that's going to happen to us, everything that happened to us, and everything that is happening to us right now, if He knows it, then we can trust Him with our lives. This morning as we move on, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's one thing to believe that you can trust God, that God can be trusted, but it's actually a totally different thing to actually choose to trust Him. Personally, this is one of the areas that we all wrestle with in our lives. This is an area that I wrestle with in my life. I'm sure you have as well. The one area that I wrestle with the most in my life is the area of finances. I constantly worry or get anxious if we have enough money in the bank, if I've got enough money to make sure the bills are paid and the needs of my family are taken care of. Recently, with the birth of our newborn, Micah, Anne decided that she's going to be a stay-at-home mom. So immediately, our income got slashed in half. And listen, I was anxious. I was worried. I was um, petrified. We were um, worried about how we're going to make it, and we both prayed. We both felt that this was where God was leading, um, but in the back of my mind, I wondered, God, are you going to provide for us? But over the last three months, we've seen constantly God faithfully taking care of our needs in a way that constantly kept reminding us of God's faithfulness and our need to trust Him. But listen, there's a big difference between believing that God can be trusted and actually trusting Him. And even though my unbelief over my finances is a small thing, the truth is if we don't trust God in the small things of life, we'll never be able to trust God in the big things of life. If we can't trust Him with the minor details of our daily living, we're not going to be able to trust Him when there are major things that come into our lives. That's why I want to shift this morning from the question, can God be trusted, to the question, will I trust God? 
Will you trust God? Will we trust God? That's the big question. And that brings us to Psalm 56. Let me give you a little background to Psalm 56 before we read it about how the, the time frame of when this psalm was written. This was a psalm that was written by King David, but it was written before he became king. He was written while he was being um, chased by King Saul. If you look at the title of the psalm, it gives us the context of when he wrote it and what was going on. It says that it, this is a psalm is a mictum. Basically, it's a musical note, and I have no idea what that means, so we'll leave that. But it's a mictum that was written by David when the Philistines seized him at, Ga at Gath. David wrote this psalm when he was running for his life. Saul, the current king, was pursuing him. And ironically, one of the places that David goes to hide from Saul was to the enemies of Israel, the Philistines. Gath was one of the cities of the Philistines. David shows up in Gath. They recognize him. They seize him. They capture him. They put him in prison. And if you want the specifics of the story, you've got to turn to 1 Samuel 21. But there's a much broader context to this psalm. See, up to this point in David's life, everything was going well for him. The first time David is mentioned in the Bible is 1 Samuel 16. And in that chapter, we see that David has a heart for God. He loves God with all of his heart. In fact, the very reason that God anoints him as the next king of Israel is because David has a heart that loves God. So God, Samuel shows up and anoints David as the next king. The next chapter, 1 Samuel 17, we see this little shepherd boy, David, standing in front of Goliath, the enemy of the Philistines, the enemy of Israel, the, the greatest warrior of the Philistines. Goliath is challenging David and Israel, and David says, don't mess with God. Goliath doesn't back down, and neither does David, and David single-handedly defeats Goliath. Everything is going well. He defeats the enemy of Israel. The people love him. They're singing songs about him. He is a national hero. Life couldn't get better, except King Saul was jealous. And he determined in his mind that he was not going to sleep till David was killed. So now David is running for his life. And scholars say for eight to ten years of David's life, he spends it running from, Saul's, from Saul. Eight to ten years. Think about it. He's anointed king. The prophet comes and says to him, you're going to be the next king. He defeats the greatest enemy of Israel. He knocks him out. He's a national hero. People are singing songs about him. But for eight to ten years of his life, he's running. It takes years before God puts him on the throne. You think David ever have to, had to wonder if he could trust God? You think David ever had to wrestle with his circumstances and wonder what is going to happen with his life? You think David ever wondered if he was ever going to make it, even though he knew the promises of God? You bet he did. And that's why he writes this psalm, and you get a glimpse of that in this psalm. Look at Psalm 56 with me. Let's read it. I'll read it. You follow along. Verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me, all day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottles. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day that I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of day. There's a lot that's in this psalm. There's a lot of things that we could unpack in here, but what I want to do this morning is simply highlight four different observations in this psalm, as it relates to trusting God with our lives, four things I want you to remember as it relates to trusting God. Here's the first one. 
from the very context of this psalm and the very nature of this psalm, we're going to be reminded right away that we all have to wrestle with the question, will I trust God? Here's why. Every one of us will encounter circumstances in our life that will require of us to choose to trust God or not trust God. Every one of us. There's no exception. David, the man after God's own heart, David, Israel's warrior, was no exception. And listen, neither are you, neither am I. Go back to verse 1 and take a close look at what David is going through and what he's feeling there. He starts the psalm by saying, be gracious to me, O God. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. But he says, for man is trampling over me. The word trample there is the idea of panting or grasping for breath. Literally, it depicts the idea of a wild animal in hot pursuit. So these people, these enemies of God, aren't just after him. They're chasing him. They're in hot pursuit. They're snapping at his heels. And this wasn't just an occasional thing. Verse 1 says that it's a continuous thing. All day long, they are attacking me. All day long, they're following me. All day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. The word proudly there is not talking about pride. It's actually a position of advantage. What David is saying that everywhere I look, everywhere I turn, they're at me. They're coming after me. They're chasing me. They're all around me. I can't get away from this. They are pursuing me. They're coming after me. They're not letting up. I can't even get a break from the stuff that life is throwing at me. Go down to verse 5. He continues there. All day long they injure my cause. All of their thoughts against me are for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps. They have waited for my life. Listen, this is pretty intense. David's life is pretty intense right now. Chances are that none of us here will ever have to or ever will experience circumstances the way David is experiencing. None of us will face circumstances the way that David is experiencing life. But... Without a doubt, every one of us will encounter our own. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because some of you right now are in the midst of a challenge in your life that demands that you trust God. You have no choice. You're in the middle of it just like David was in the middle of it. But for a lot of us this morning, life is pretty good, right? Our kids are healthy. Our marriages are going well. We've got a roof over our head. We aren't starving for food. Classes are going well. It's only been week one. We haven't taken a test yet. So far, it's good. Um, There's money in our bank account. Our jobs are stable. Things couldn't get better in life. By the way, if that is where you are in life, thank God for that. That is God's grace and mercy on your life. But please understand, there will come a time where your circumstances will challenge you and stretch you and move you and compel you to either trust God or to run from God. There will. It might be something small of maybe just finances. It might be graduating and wonder what your next job is. It might be a health issue. It might be a family member that's sick. It might be anything, but there are choices and circumstances that happen in our lives that will compel us to either trust God or run from God. There's a tension that we as followers of Jesus are constantly living with. Jesus teaches us that we shouldn't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what tomorrow brings because your life is in his hands. But at the same time, we can't be naive naive enough to think that we're not going to face any problems in our lives. Jesus says in John 16 that in this world, you will have problems. In this world, you're going to face trouble. Do you know that Jesus was talking not to people that don't know Jesus, but he was actually talking to followers of Jesus. He was talking to people that gave their lives to him, and he's saying, listen, you're going to face problems in your life. You're going to face difficulties. You're going to face challenges in your life. In fact, on numerous occasions, Jesus says, the world hates me. The world hates my plans and purposes. And listen, if they hate me, they're going to hate those who follow me. They hate, there's trouble in your life because you're a follower of Jesus. But that's not the only reason there's trouble. That's not the only reason there are circumstances that have to force you to trust and follow God. We all need to admit that there are times where God will allow trouble in our life to make us into the people that he wants us to be. And we need to accept that. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care. 
It doesn't mean that God isn't in control. It just means that God has a greater purpose. And David is a great example of this because all the lessons that David learned while he was running from Saul, God used that to prepare him for the day that he would be leading the people of Israel. And the same is true of you. The same is true of me. If God allows it in your life, then you've got to trust that God is using it to prepare you for something greater than just your present happiness and comfort. See, God's got this pattern that he does with the people that he chooses and the people that he loves. The same was true of David. The same was true of Abraham. The same was true of Joseph. The same was true of Moses. And the pattern is very simple. Here's what it is. God works in us before he works through us. God works in you before he can actually use you. You can flip it around and say it this way. God actually will work more effectively through you if you allow him to work in you. That's exactly what's happening to David here in our passage. God's preparing him. God's using these circumstances in his life to do something in him. And the most important thing that God wants to do in your life and God wants to do in my life is to teach us to trust him with our lives. That's the most important thing that God could ever teach us. There's no better place to learn to trust God than in the midst of circumstances that require that we trust. My kids, my two older ones, not the baby, um, is learning how to swim. Um, where they want to learn how to swim. And when they came to us and said, hey, we want to learn swimming, we didn't buy a DVD and make them watch the DVD. Right? Um, we didn't buy a game on our Wii and say, all right, practice on this and then you'll know how to swim. That's not what we did. What we did is we threw them into the water, right? I mean, okay, we had put a life jacket on them, but um, we threw them into the water. We put a life jacket on them, made them comfortable where they were comfortable with water. And so eventually when they got comfortable, the life jacket enabled them to get comfortable, but it didn't teach them how to swim. Eventually we had to take the life jacket off of them. And a few weeks ago, in like a couple hours, Rennie and Christy were able to teach them how to swim in just a few hours, and they were able to swim from one side of the pool to the other side of the pool. You get the point. You can't just talk about trusting God without being in circumstances where you don't have to trust God. The best way to learn to trust God is to be in circumstances where you have to learn. The best way to learn to swim is to actually be in the water. Every circumstance in your life and every circumstance in my life is one of two things. It's either an obstacle or it's an opportunity. Every circumstance is an obstacle to our faith or it's an opportunity to demonstrate our faith. And the determining factor of whether it will be an obstacle or an opportunity is our choice. It is whether or not we will choose to demonstrate our faith by trusting God. And that's what David does in our text. Look at verse 3. I love David's honesty and transparency here. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, even though he was a warrior, even though he was a national hero, he wasn't afraid to admit to God that he was scared. He goes, God, I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Look at what he does with his fear. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Verse 4, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Look at verse 11. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Listen, David chose to trust God. He chose to turn his circumstances into an opportunity to demonstrate his faith by trusting God. He chose to trust. He says pretty much, God, I'm scared to death. I have no idea what's going to happen to me, but I'm choosing to run to you. I'm choosing to cling to you. I'm choosing to hold tight to you. By the way, that word trust there, that's exactly what that word means. The idea there of the word trust, it literally means to hold on to, to cling to, to hold tightly. It's the same word that's used in Proverbs 3 where Solomon writes, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Literally saying, hold on to God with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will guide your steps. Literally, hold on to God. David had incredible faith, and he chose to trust God when he was going through life's difficulty. Not only did he have faith in God to deliver him, but he also had faith in God's heart and plan for his life. Verse, look at the last two verses of the psalm, verse 12, verse 13. Here's what David says. 
I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. This speaks volumes of David's trust in what he was going through because at the end of the psalm, he is anticipating God to deliver him. He's trusting that God will set him free. He's anticipating that God will act. Verse 13, you delivered my soul from death. My soul. He doesn't say my life. He says my soul. David is not assuming that God is going to deliver him physically but he's confident that no matter what happens to his physical body, that God will take care of him, that his soul is secure. God's got him. That's why in the next phrase he can say, God, you're going to keep my feet from falling. Whatever happens to me, whatever life throws at me, I'm going to stand tall because I'm trusting you. And here's the outcome of it, end of verse 13, that I'm going to walk in the light of life. Basically, I'm going to live my life for God and his glory. This speaks of David's confidence, but listen, it also speaks of his relationship with God. The very definition of trust implies intimacy. You and I are not going to run to someone or trust someone or lean on someone unless we trust them. Listen, if I don't know you, I'm not going to trust you with my kids. But if I know you and I trust you, then I have no problem letting my kids be around you, right? I mean, there's a trust level. There is, I know who you are. I know um, your character. I know your traits. I know that when my kids are around you, you're going to be safe because I trust you. You and I are not going to trust someone unless we know them. And that brings brings me to the second observation. You can only trust someone that you know. You can only trust someone that you know. In Psalm 9, David says, those who know your name, O God, they will trust you. Basically, to know God's name means to know him deeply, to know him intimately. It describes someone who feels secure with God, someone who trusts God, someone who knows his heart, someone who believes that God is good, someone that believes that God cares, someone who believes that God has a plan and purpose for their lives. And so David could say in Psalms 9, 9, verse 9, that God is a stronghold in time of trouble because I know his name, because I can trust him. See, you don't say things like that or believe things like that unless you know someone. The entire psalm, Psalm 56, screams of intimacy with God. Not only because David pours out his heart to God, but also because of what David says in the midst of his troubles. Look at verse 4. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? What can flesh do to me? That's a statement affirming God's protection and God's power. Look at verse 9. This I know, God is for me. Verse 11. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? David was able to trust God because he knew God and because God knew him. Verse 8 is one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible. And it's one of the most comforting and memorable passages here. But I want you to notice that this verse speaks not of David's intimacy with God, but of God's intimacy with David. God, you count my tossings. You put my tears in bottles. Are they not in your book? The word tossing there means wanderings. It's used there to refer to a fugitive. What David is saying is, God, every cave that I hid in, every time I ran away, every place I've gone, all of my wrestlings, all of my struggles, all of my doubts, all of my tears, every tear I've shed, God, you know them, and God, you've got them. So God, I'm going to trust you with my life. Can I encourage you this morning to hold on to verse 8, especially in times of trouble? Let's face it, in times of trouble, the last thing that we do is run to God, right? The last thing we think about is God help when we're going through difficulties. We run to anything and everything else that will help us cope with what we're going through. But God does help. 
He does care. That's why regular time in God's Word and regular time praying and regular time being with God, those spiritual habits that the Bible encourages are so important for us as followers of Jesus because without them, we're not going to go deeper in our trust for God. Listen, I hope you know, and I've got to remind myself of this all the time, that reading our Bibles and going to church and praying are not things that we do to get a relationship with God, and they're not things that we do to keep a relationship with God. There are things that we do to grow in our relationship with God. You don't get saved or go to heaven because you read your Bible and because you go to church. Um, you are saved, um, and because you're saved, you do those things. Those things help you grow in your relationship with God. We do those things to grow closer to God. We need them. These are spiritual habits that we need to develop in our lives because the outcome of doing these spiritual habits in our lives is that we learn to trust God. The more you read of God's word and learn that he is faithful and good, the more you're intimate with God and you're talking to him and praying to him and being in his presence, the more you learn to trust God with your life. And you don't, again, you don't trust someone that you don't know. You got to know him in order to trust him. Some of you this morning are struggling to trust God. Maybe you've never embraced Jesus as your savior. And understandably, you're struggling with that. And if that is you, let me encourage you. You're not here because a friend invited you. You're not here because you just chose to be here this morning. You're here because God this morning began to work in your heart and brought you here. You could have been anywhere else, but God is working in your life. And you're here because God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. The Holy Spirit is the one that is dealing with your heart. And I encourage you this morning, get to know God. He loves you. He wants you. For a lot of us as believers, we struggle to trust God because we don't know him deeply. So what we need to do is we need to begin these spiritual habits in our lives that will compel us and move us to know God's heart, to know him more intimately, to grow, to trust him more. Because again, we won't trust someone we won't know. We're not. Let me take it a step further. You also can't trust without help. You can't trust without help. Go back to verse 1. Notice how David starts this psalm. Be gracious to me, O God. This one little phrase reminds us that trusting God requires the grace of God. That's the third observation. To trust God, we need God's grace. This word grace is a word that's used over and over in Scripture. You see it throughout Scripture. It's a term that literally means to bend or stoop. Every time you read this word grace, imagine the idea of a guy stooping down as if like my son was right here and me talking to him face to face. That I have to get down to his level. And when you read the idea of grace, you see it one of two ways. Either God is stooping down to save us from sin, to rescue us out of the mess that we're in, or he's stooping down to sustain us so that we can live the life that God's calling us to live. Let me give you an example. When God stoops down and sends Jesus to live the life that we should have lived and die the death that we should have died, he stoops down to rescue us from sin, to rescue us from our damnation. But when God sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, he stoops down to sustain us, to help us so that we can live the life that we're called to live. So when we see the word grace, picture it, God coming down to us. God giving us something that we don't deserve. Here in Psalm um, 56, David writes, God, be gracious to me. If you flip over um, a couple of chapters before in Psalm 51, it's a confession of David, and David is confessing his sin after he's been caught in adultery. And the very first verse there says, God, be merciful to me. The very same word, just translated differently. What David is saying is, God, be gracious to me. There he's saying, God, be gracious to me and save me from my sin. But in Psalm 56, he says, God, be gracious to me. And what he's saying there is, God, I'm struggling. There's difficulties. There's trials going on. God, be gracious to me and sustain me in the midst of this. Hold me while I'm going through this. Keep me that I don't fall and stumble. God, be gracious to me. And in the context, God, David is saying, God, help me to trust you. Help me to trust you. 
kind of sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? We're supposed to ask God to help us to trust God? Yep, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Because without it, we're not going to be able to trust. Trusting God requires God's grace and God's help. I said this last week, but trusting God is the hardest thing that we will ever do. It's incredibly difficult. One of the reasons that it is so hard is because it is not our natural desire to run to God when life is rough. It's not natural for us. What is natural for us is to run from God and to cling to anything and everything that will help us cope with whatever we're going through. That's what's natural for us. But this is where the Holy Spirit gives us grace. He stoops down into our lives and He whispers in our ears, run to God, go to Him. He's good. He's caring. He's sovereign. He knows what He's doing. He's got you in His hands. He will take care of you. He knows what is best. This is God's grace in our lives. That when life is difficult, the Holy Spirit is there to remind us God is in control of our lives. Listen, please don't ever assume that you just need God's grace to save you. You also need God's grace to sustain you. You don't just need God's grace to save you from sin. You also need His grace to make sure you make it in day in and day out. There's a great, great story in Mark 9 about a father that comes to Jesus whose son is, has an unclean spirit. And the father comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, if you can, will you heal my son? And Jesus looks at him and says, if I can, all things are possible to him that believe. And the father makes this profound statement. When Jesus says all things are possible to him that believe, the father says, Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. Very similar to what David is saying here. God, I know that you can be trusted, but I need help to choose to trust you. This is a phrase, I believe, but help my unbelief, that needs to be in our vocabulary as followers of Jesus. I believe, but help my unbelief. Because again, it's one of those prayers that remind us of our constant, continual dependence on God for everything of our lives. I believe God, but help my unbelief. I believe you, but help me in my unbelief. Can I say this? If you think, if you don't think that you are dependent on God, or if you think that you don't need God's help, it's very likely that God will bring you to a place in your life where you will recognize that. It will. He will. Maybe that's what He's doing right now in your life. And there's an old adage that says, we don't realize that Jesus is all we need till Jesus is all we got. But when Jesus is all we got, we realize that Jesus is all that we need. And as strange as this sounds, the hardest place but the best place for you to be is completely and totally dependent upon God. But to live there and to stay there requires a choice. That's our final observation. Trusting God is not a one-time decision. It's an ongoing choice. It's a decision that you make every day of your life. I find it interesting in this psalm, and in other psalms that David writes where he finds himself struggling, that he repeats and he restates his resolve to trust God. He's not forgetful. He's intentional. Look at the first two verses again. In these verses, David states his predicament. He's struggling. He's going through difficulties. He's going through hardships. God, this is what I'm going through. But in verse 3 and 4, he states his resolve to trust God. He says, God, I'm going to trust you no matter what happens. But then in verse 5 through 7, he again, he states his predicament. He says, God, I'm struggling again. I'm going through difficulties. I'm going through hardships. And then he goes through verses 8 and 11. And he says, I'm going to trust you anyway. He repeats himself over and over. Here's what he's doing. He's choosing again and again, over and over, to trust God, to believe God, to know that God is good with his life. When David begins to be fearful, he trusts 
Every time he thinks about his circumstances, he trusts. Every time he turns around and sees his enemies behind him, he trusts. Every time he grows discouraged, he trusts. Every time he wonders what's going to happen to him, he trusts. Every time he doesn't know what he's going to do, he trusts. He trusts God over and over with his life. He doesn't say, God, I'm going to figure this out on my own. He chooses to trust God with his life. Trusting God is not a one-time decision. I wish it was, but it's not. It's an ongoing, everyday, sometimes moment by moment, hour by hour, minute by minute decision and choice to trust him and to hold on tight. That's what it means to trust. That's what it means to cling to God. It doesn't mean that we'll always understand what's going on. It doesn't mean that we'll, it won't, we won't hurt. It doesn't mean that sometimes we won't have doubts. It simply means that we acknowledge that God can be trusted and that God should be trusted. See, this is why I love these kind of psalms. They remind us that God can handle our wrestling. God can handle our struggles. Listen, God can even handle our doubts. In fact, I think that God invites that kind of transparency from us. David is incredibly transparent here to say, God, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. And listen, God invites that kind of transparency from each of us. Because when, like David, we go to God and we pour our hearts out to him, what we're really doing is we're demonstrating to God that, God, we depend on you. God, we need you. God, help. God, move on my behalf. It is one way that we choose to trust God. So two questions. Can we trust God? Absolutely. He's your creator. There's nothing too big for him. He never sleeps, so nothing surprises him. He's always with you, so nothing catches him off guard. There's nothing that's going to happen to you unless God allows it. Will you trust God? That's a choice. That is your choice. That's my choice. That's something that we have to do every single day. There's this beautiful hymn. Binnell sang the chorus of it already. It's called, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. But there's one phrase in there that resonates with me as we look at this chapter. It says, oh, for grace to trust him more. For grace to trust him more. This morning, before we go into communion, the worship team is going to sing this song, and I'm going to invite you to stand and let this song resonate with you. Would you meditate on these words? And if you're in an area of your life where you are doubting God, maybe you're worried about maybe what this semester is bringing. Maybe you're worried about a job after college. Maybe you're worried about your health or your family, whatever it may be. This morning, would you be open, transparent with God and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but help me. God, help. I believe that you are good. I believe you're my creator. I believe you never sleep. I, ne I believe that you're always with me, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief that help me to trust you no matter what I go through. Help me to trust you no matter what happens in my life. Help me to trust you that you are faithful, that you are good, and that you have a plan and purpose for me. Help me to trust you. Help my unbelief. Give me grace to trust you more. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing this song. And would that be your prayer? Oh, for grace to trust you more. Let's worship him.